So this is your major, and today you will pre be presenting a comparison of perceptions of Native Americans and their practices from the expeditions of Lewis and Clark to conservationism of the early early 20th century. Please join me in welcoming Lewis. So uh, first, I'd like to uh, show you all this picture. Um, it's just a normal picture of a wildfire in a forest, but what the wildfire is doing could be seen as destroying the brush, the trees, a couple habitats, or it could be viewed as clearing land. Native Americans have used wildfires across North America for various uh, reasons. Uh, the local, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Cayupa, uh, the local Cayupa tribe of the Willamette Valley, um, for example, had multiple burning seasons for fantastic fox fire updates, uh, multiple burning seasons for things like walnuts, um, walnuts and grasses and etc. Um, these burnings actually made the plant life life healthier in the uh, Willamette Valley and the Kalupa tribe um, used the fire to basically make their agriculture more productive, burn some, uh, burn some land for more grasses so that they could feed their horses, and also create more hunting ground for big game animals such as deer that uh, they could eat. And uh, is that not such a useful tool? Um, uh, conservationists of the early 20th century, late 19th century, would say slightly otherwise. Um, and hello, that's my name. It's already been presented, and I am presenting evidence for my paper on a comparison of perceptions of Native American uh, and their practices from the expeditions of Lewis and Clark and conservation of the early 20th century. Um, in this presentation, I will be presenting on the topic of European perceptions of Native Americans and how these have influenced the views of which we look at Native Americans. I would like to start off with the main points of the presentation. Uh, first, I will be looking at the conservation movement of the late 19th, earlier 20th centuries. Um, with a small prelude of one naturalist, and all emphasizing, of course, the main points of uh, the conservation movement overall. Then I will be uh, connecting the conservation movement with the explorations of Lewis and Clark, where Lewis and Clark's findings and the reason for exploring the Pacific Northwest will be discussed. Um, soon after, I will be moving 20 years forward to David Douglas's um, journey, travels in 1824 in the Pacific Northwest, and discuss the main, and compare them with findings of Lewis and Clark. Uh, finally, I will be discussing the topics of trade and also um, conceptions of Eden that both Lewis and Clark and David Douglas's journal had in, yep. So to start off, um, before the conservation movement, uh, there was na uh, naturalism. And one of the uh, main figures of naturalism is uh, Henry David Thoreau. Naturalists believe that nature is something that must be for, uh, nature is something that is beautiful and must be preserved. Uh, uh, David uh, Thoreau uh, uh, was a, a philosopher in the 1840s, and he most famously wrote the essay on civil disobedience. But more importantly for today, uh, he wrote a journal of record of his time in the Massachusetts woodlands in which he described his experience. 
Um, he saw the damage done by local farmers and loggers, noting that in his journal, many of these farmers and loggers were just cutting down trees for profit and not necessarily using uh, the wilderness to any full advantage besides the capital profit margin. Uh, him and a few other naturalists would tend to see um, capitalist uh, gains from uh, exploitation of nature as time went on. Uh, the conservation movement, uh, it, the naturalist movement evolved into the conservationists. The naturalists evolved and became the con part of the conservationists. And the goals of the conservation movement were to preserve the natural resources because uh, as the 19th century was coming to a close, there seemed to be a limit on the resources, including a limit to nature itself. Uh, the natural resources of any given region were in fact considered under constant threat from the influence of human culture. A variety of Native American farmers used the countryside for gathering resources such as food, but their techniques for gathering such food, uh, firewood, were of course seen as threatening to nature itself. Uh, going back to wildfire, Native American tribes and later um, farmers would use the wildfire for specifically like farming. And fire was even used in southern plantations in order to help in agricultural gains. But uh, wildfire practices used by some of the uh, farmers actually uh, were uncontrolled initially, so they burned down a little bit more than they should have. So, <clears throat> and therefore it seemed to harm the wildlife in the region. Uh, while this might not have been the intent of the burnings, it was despised by the conservation movement the uncontrolled wildfires. Other unregulated activities were also considered a threat to nature. Uh, poaching, by, poaching by pretty much Native Americans or farmers was considered a threat because it killed wildlife. Um, and thus permits were starting to be required as time went on to prevent the uh, excess hunting that happened and fishing uh, fishing without fishing with a net was also seen as excess because you took out a lot of fish at once which is why a lot of fishing licenses uh, shifted their attention to fishing with a hook rather than a net which was more efficient now the conservation movement its influence upon Native Americans uh, besides naming them as enemies of the environment, the aftermath of the conservation movement uh, comes most easily in like the 1970s. There was, a, there was a commercial in the 1970s that was played on television broadcast of which a Native American in a canoe uh, <coughs> along a river comes up along the uh, shore and there's trash along the shore. And as you can potentially see right here there's supposed to be a tear coming down his eye. That perception was partially made up uh, but for the sake of corporations blaming uh, basically blaming the public for uh, loitering the environment and using Native Americans as like the image of sorrow for that. Um, Native Americans, of course, use the environment to their need. A story about Yellowstone Park goes like this. A couple of visitors in the 1880s uh, were out camping, and by the next morning they awoke to a large number of Nez Perce tribesmen. Uh, the Nez Perce were actually running to the Canadian border in order to escape the United States government um, 
and specifically the United States Cavalry, because they didn't want to be put on a reservation. Um, and the surprising fact about this was Native American, the Nez Perce, and Native Americans in general were thought to have been scared of the Yellow State, Yellowstone National Park area because of the volcanic activity in the geysers and heated waters. When in reality, the heated waters and geyser activities acted more like a uh, washer dryer kind of effect for their clothes. And in fact, there were a lot of uh, routes leading in and out of Yellowstone National Park that no one really knew about for a while. So now we go back um, 80 years from that story to Lewis and Clark's exploration. Their exploration took them from St. Louis all the way to the Oregon coast and back. And the part that we're going to be focusing on is their trek on the Columbia River over here. Uh, so they had started their funding with uh, from so the exploration of Lewis and Clark from 1803 to 1806 um, was funded by the United States government under President Thomas Jefferson III, President of the United States, of which Louisiana Purchase, this entire expanse, was recently purchased. And stretching, basically, Louisiana onto the border of Oregon country. And Lewis and Clark's journey took them up the Missouri River, across the Continental Divide, um, up, very, up and down various areas, trying to find like a Northwest Passage for ships, because that was one of the goals of their expedition, secretly. Um, and uh, during the winter of 1805 and 1806, Lewis and Clark actually camped out um, along the Oregon coast, um, along the Oregon coast over here. And uh, the tribes of the Columbia River Basin were slightly different than the tribes that they had left behind um, over in Idaho over here. Uh, one of the differences were their, was their shorter stature because of the diet they ate, and uh, they were even seen as a little, bro a little bit grotesque to Lewis and Clark because they were more used to the uh, the taller uh, the taller horse riders, uh, the taller Native Americans who were over here, and not along the river. But the one thing they did discover on their way down the Columbia River was many of the Native American tribes along the Columbia River actually understood many English words and English terms already as they were going downriver, such as like, um, such as uh, gun uh, and so forth. Uh, this was in part because there were earlier expeditions by uh, British explorers and also an American explorer who called uh, Captain Robert Gray who in fact uh, was the first American to sail into the Columbian River and uh, part of um, Robert Gray's discovery of the Columbia River going into it, he, uh, his ship, the Columbia, was actually named, the river was named after that ship. While the bay just, uh, the bay just at the border of the Columbia River over here is named after him as well. And uh, this trade was actually part of the reason why Lewis and Clark's and the United States government had a claim to Oregon country, and why they went further than Louisiana Purchase on their journey um, across the American, North American continent. Lewis and Clark, of course, were remapping the region because a lot of Robert Gray's materials were actually unpublished at the time. Um, and so they had to remap basically the entirety of this area. They had to uh, also take in ethnographic data on Native American tribes 
each one they encountered. Um, for example, um, the one of a few, uh, one or two of the tribes over here actually had um, flattened their heads purposefully um, as their own like little cultural different perk that they had over here. And uh, Lewis and Clark were also establishing uh, trade relations with the Native Americans and starting to put together treaties. And that was one of the most important parts of their journey. Now, 20 years later, uh, David Douglas, this handsome man over here, um, actually uh, came in through the Pacific and uh, through the English uh, Horticultural Society, he had funding to go up the Columbia River and not just explore, but take some plants from the region and basically cr uh, collect scientific data between 1824 and 1827. Um, Oregon country, though explored two decades prior by Lewis and Clark, um, the plant life, of course, in the region was not entirely explored. Lewis and Clark, of course, did collect a couple specimens, but that wasn't their main purpose of their expedition 20 years earlier. Um, where Lewis and Clark, in fact, opened up the Oregon country to the United States, uh, David Douglas had opened the region to the scientific community. Um, he interacted with Native Americans slightly differ differently than Lewis and Clark um, because David Douglas was using the Native Americans to collect plant life and associated different tribes with certain plant life. and. Uh, David Douglas knew of a tobacco strain that one particular um, that one particular Native American tobacco plantation had that came from the Midwest that was completely foreign to the region, and uh, uh, David Douglas decided to trade with the local farmer for his own commercial tobacco, which. They both exchanged, and uh, to basically share each other's samples. Now, David Douglas um, had also run into more fur traders than Lewis and Clark had two decades later, um, and many of the fur traders were, in fact. Um, really well versed in many of the rapids up and down the Columbia River, um, more so than David Douglas, who many times actually would rather rather walk on the side of the Columbia River than go down or up the river rapids with his plant supplies. Um, Native Americans, you, uh, he also, many of the boats that were used up and down the Columbia River for his expeditions were Native American New. American canoes, of which once or twice even slept in a canoe during his time in Oregon country. Um, let's see. So, one of the biggest similarities to David Douglas and Lewis and Clark's expeditions were the uh, networks of trade that were found or kind of noticed. Uh, Native Americans had been traveling, had been trading with each other for many years, but, um, and it had been flourishing for a long time. Um, Lewis and Clark, and Lewis and Clark, when they came into the region, were, in, while they were exploring, and when they came back to the United States, had actually encouraged a bunch of fur traders to come over to Oregon country and because there was a high number of furs. So uh, that is why David Douglas years later would see multiple fur companies and multiple fur traders within Oregon country 
that hadn't existed there prior. <clears throat> In fact, let's see. Uh, let's see. In fact, uh, Port Victoria, um, which is north of Port, wait, nope, sorry, Port, um, Fort, uh, Fort Vancouver, north of Portland, was only established a couple years prior to David Douglas actually arriving in Oregon country. And uh, the uh, fur trade specifically demanded Native Americans go out and hunt uh, animals for their furs and give back to give to the Europeans at the forts, of which there were actually two fur trades in the region. There was one based on the rivers, and there was also a maritime uh, trade that started, or that was started initially by the Russians, where the furs would actually be traded. Um, the Native Americans would go out and hunt sea otters, give the furs to uh, European traders, Russian, British, or American, who would then resell it in China as an export. And, uh, let's see. Oh, wow. Yeah. I apologize. Oh, it's longer than I thought it would be. So do you still have a couple minutes for questions? Um. As you were talking, and there's so much content here, it's all, to me, really interesting. It reminded me of like the vogue for travel writing. You know, in the 1830s, you have all these people coming to America, like Alexis de Tocqueville, um, explaining America to the rest of the world and, and to Americans themselves. And Francis Trollope, from the Life of Anthony Trollope, was writing a lot of books about America and the North Manor in the 1830s. But what connects your research is that you've got Lewis and Clark as the first, and then you talk about Thoreau in the 1840s. And it seems like David Douglas is the link between these two. Mm -hmm. Whereas people tend to jump from Lewis and Clark straight to Thoreau, you've got this guy who's in there exploring the interior. Um, and they're all explaining or trying to explain Native Americans, natural life, and then networks of commerce. So that might be one way that you situate um, David Douglas and what he was doing and why it's important, maybe. Yeah, uh, look, um, you weren't able to finish, so I'm, I'm just wondering if you have an assessment then about what you can learn from Lewis and Clark and David Douglas. Does it confirm what the conservationists have thought about Native Americans? Are you finding something different? Um, I'm finding that um, there was a, there was actually a, uh, slide on basically Eden where Lewis and Clark and David Douglas basically uh, noticed that there is like a nearly unlimited supply of wildlife and plant life within Oregon country and within North America that was different from what the uh, conservationists would later uh, recall. It might be of some importance, especially since the uh, Native American population was extremely high about the time that Lewis and Clark came. Mm -hmm. And it would dwindle significantly after that. So the period in which you have significant numbers of Native Americans, you have um, really a sort of appreciation of natural abundance. Maybe that's useful. Um, I was just wondering, um, so I guess as you know, people are starting to reevaluate how we maintain our landscapes, um, have, have there been movements recently and like return to you know, letting wildfires burn through or managing it with more natural, non-chemical um, things? Like I know, um, at least in Benton County, or I think technically it's Lynn County, there's a lot of conversation about field burning. Um, and it has been for several years because different people want to, different farmers want to be able to use that for pest control. Um, so I mean, is there 
have, have modern uh, scientists and environmentalists been looking back at what the ways in which Native Americans did conserve the land, um, and then looking bringing that into the future use or anything that you know of? Um. I can't say for sure about um, modern use of wildfire, but what I can probably say is that it depends on the re uh, the place, uh, the region or place, because um, a lot of uh, a lot of like national forests um, like to do controlled wildfires, but they don't want to uh, burn trees around like the pathways that people walk or you don't want to have a controlled wildfire near residents in a somewhat suburban location with risk of having houses burned down. Uh, but beyond that I have uh, no knowledge of that. So, so it's urban. Uh,